All right, welcome divas to our last Tuesday of 2021. I'm so excited to get to continue in this uh, vein of learning and really understanding how um, nutrition and the food choices that we make impact our health. And remember, my goal is always to give you uh, a few seeds that are deep in science, that we can really grow some new perspectives and ultimately some new activities. And so I really value your input on uh, if this class is helping you with really application of nutrition. What are we gonna eat today for lunch? What are we gonna put on our grocery list for next week? Those are the things I'm really hoping that we can um, embellish on and really in provide some insight as to why and how to keep moving forward in the vein of, of learning in, in nutrition and, and education around our, our health. So um, what we're gonna look at today it, is sort of a second part. And honestly, I keep digging in and realizing, wow, there's even more information I wanna cover. Um, but I, I promise Jose that we will keep building on. And so next week will be a, a little, di little deeper dive into a couple of the topics from today. But what I wanna cover um, is looking at the phytoestrogens and really how they help overall um, health and wellness. Now I specifically say postmenopausal health. Uh, dudes, please don't be offended by that because um, really this is an outreach to all of um, our body parts. Now, specifically because of menopause changes, that we have a distinct change in our estrogen. Of course, men also have a menopause of sorts because their hormone levels change as well. So please know that I'm not trying to dis, um, not have you as part of this conversation. It's absolutely for men and women. So what I want to talk about today a little deeper is bone strength, um, of course, cardiovascular protection, and then looking at the female cancer specifically, and then the reduction of symptoms that are really a cause of uh, lowering of the sex hormones. Um, you've, you've heard us talk a lot about how the biome influences um, the way our body metabolizes uh, our food and gets the most out of it. We've learned that there's phytochemicals in lots of foods. And so what I want to look at a little bit today is bone strengthening and some of the research around vitamin D metabolism, of course, exercise, not to mention the gut biome as being a really important part of how we understand uh, and mitigate our potential risk uh, and related to our nutrition. And then we'll look at the cardiovascular elements. Um, we're gonna look at dietary fat intake, uh, exercise, and of course the impact of fiber. And when we look at the Mediterranean eating style, remember that um, we're always going back to real foods. And so supplementation is something that I want us to be really careful with. I mentioned that last time in our class because um, there's so many unknowns about supplementation. Um, so what I always want us to turn back to is how do we um, develop a, a grassroots approach in our body of really getting um, more plant-based foods that allow us to have more fiber, more natural uh, dietary fat intake that provides those essential omega-3s, and how do we understand the difference between the saturated fats and the monounsaturates. And of course, looking at um, the ways that we might be able to prevent or just halt the, the responsiveness of those cancer cells to, um, to hormones and why do some people have a greater um, affinity for that growth than others. And we suggested last time that we think there's um, going to be some correlation to the number of biome varieties, so the number of gut bacteria that's in our b body, and that's really grown from childhood up. So we know that when we want to improve our uh, body's use of phytochemicals, sometimes trying to take a supplement, especially if we do it later in life, might cause some questionable outcomes. And that's why doctors are oftentimes a f little bit conservative when they are trying to say, yes, soy is good for you, or uh, yes, black cohosh is something that's, that's fine to take, because the studies will sometimes make it look really muddy. 
when we take that supplement, what form it comes in, is it just a, a tea made with a certain root or is it a pill that has a very concentrated form? And so we know that all of these issues are really front of mind for us. And so how do we now take this information and go shopping with it? Um, so before I go any further, I want to make sure that we're kind of on the same page. Did you have any questions from, um, from our last discussion, specifically around the supplements? And so I'm going to put up here on my, my board here kind of the topics that we're going to dig from. So we know that um, diet has a big impact because of the fats, uh, the fiber, the variety, and of course the fiber has soluble fiber and insoluble. Fats, anybody remember the types of fats? We had the essential fatty acids. So we had the essential fatty acids. And of those, you, what's the common one that you can get as a supplement? The famous omega-3, right? Um, so there's lots of fats, of course. There are saturated fats as well as polyunsaturated and saturated fats. So when we look at these different types of fats, um, the industry has told us that when we think of heart health, we know that for dietary fat intake, we want to make sure that we have more of the, what kind? More of the essential fatty acids that are omega-3s. Which ones do we want to avoid? Fats to avoid, we want to say, oh, saturated fats are bad. Saturated gets a bad face. And essential fatty acids like omegas are the good ones. They get a happy face. And so when we think of foods that provide the ones with this happy face, what foods do they come in? We look at the Mediterranean diet, and we know that... What's right in the middle? Yes, olive oil, nuts, seeds, fish. So when we go to the ideas around cardiovascular health, around diet that impacts certain areas, even of our gut biome and of our uh, overall health, we know that the Mediterranean diet idea really feeds into the idea of where we get our good fats. Is there a case when we should say, well, what's, what's more important than my Mediterranean diet is I should just take some pills? Anytime you can think of? So sometimes if we see a deficiency that might be a warranted reason. Sometimes if we see that our uh, familial characteristics, so our, our genetics, have given us a predisposition to very high levels of cholesterol, sometimes taking a higher dosage of something will help. Sometimes, not all the time. So taking an insurance is probably not necessary if we're going to believe that our Mediterranean diet is going to take care of us, right? So, so I always want to make sure that we know our situation, we know our genetics, we know our predisposition before we act, because we don't want just a blanket statement of insurance. That's where, you know, we could fall into some risk. Remember we talked about last week that um, there's some harm in the harmless. Anybody remember that topic? there's harms in the harmless and that one of those was gosh you could actually hurt your organs if you over supplement on something of course there's cost of course there's also boy I've tried everything and I'm still not seeing overall health so all those reasons are why we want to make sure we know what we're doing and why but when it comes to diet I think we can fairly uh, be, be fairly confident that phytoestrogens are those very wonderful pr uh, components of foods and Finding fats in our diet are going to be a great way to do it. We also talked a lot about the nuts and seeds. 
So in addition to the essential fats, what else are the nuts and seeds giving us? Minerals, other micronutrients, and we could list all those, those cool names like the polyphenols and the indoles and the phytonutrients. Um, or we can just say, yeah, it has a lot of good pr components in it. And so I love the fact that there's more to it than just at first glance. Because when we start looking at this broader scope of where we get our good healthy oils, we also find fibers and we find those micronutrients. Okay, so as we think of the phytoestrogens and health, and then we look at diet, we know that fats are really key in delivering some of those important components. We also want to look at variety. So if I have a client that talks to me about uh, trying to be healthy and they say, Suzanne, just give me a diet and tell me exactly what I eat. I'll eat the same thing every day. I don't really care. I just want to be healthy. What do you think my answer would be? Exactly. No, don't do the same thing every day. Variety is super important. Remember the challenge we talked about um, in the last several sec uh, sessions? We said, let's see if you can get 30 different plants in your diet every day. Wow. And of course, everybody had, you know, jaws drop and thought, there's just no way I'm going to be able to do that. That's craziness. But when we started looking at all the different ways that we can add one more, two more, five more, then it's not that tough. Even as simple as our, our herbs and spices, if we get five different or organic herbs that we put on our eggs in the morning, we get to count those. So um, as I dig deep and I wanna answer some questions around the association of plant-based foods and the cardiovascular health, I start looking at um, a meta-analysis. So last week we talked a lot about how do we understand a, a good research article. We talked a lot about um, it being double blind. We talked about a large population, all those details that help us understand if the science is accurate. And so um, when we look at this, this is a, a systematic review. So it's looking at lots of different studies and trying to make some assumptions from it. And so the good news is that when we look through this, um, we understand there is a very large sample size because we've been able to put a lot of studies together. And to date, the comprehensive study examines the effect of plant-based diet on major clinical endpoints. Um, the findings highlight the favorable role of a healthy plant-based diet in reducing cardiovascular mortality. And what's important to know is that when we look at how they studied the, diet, the dietary practices, they always used the, um, the Mediterranean um, pattern. It was conducted um, over several years, and so it gives us a lot of really cool information. And so I, I'll send you this if you'd like to have a, a reference. Um, I think I can one. Cannot be loaded. Yeah, that's figures. Let me get to my other one then. So in addition to looking at how a, an original study is set up, uh, the other thing that's great is to look at um, research that looks at many of the studies and really analyzes their research to decide, is it really saying what we think that it's saying, what the authors are trying to tell us? And then are we finding similar outcomes in lots of different studies? And so I really liked that. I think it was a, a valuable approach. Um, this is another one. Um, let's see. So when we look at the, the vitamin D and metabolism, if we go to a little more deeper study of the bone health, we looked at cardiovascular, now let's look at bone health. So vitamin D supplementation has been a big topic. Does it even when I worked at HEB, there was uh, a big push for lots of um, reasons to start supplementing with vitamin D. Um, does anybody take vitamin D now? Yeah, and so doctors will look at your labs and they'll see that you might be borderline, you know, you might be barely in range or you might be completely out of range. When I look at the meta-analysis studies, now we've been supplementing with D for, for many years. Um, the disappointing part is that we actually 
did not see the positive responses to vitamin D supplementation. And so that concerned me because, you know, we, we as healthcare providers really were confident that if you have a deficiency, we should be able to give a supplement and see some improvement. But that actually didn't happen. And so then it makes us wonder why. So vitamin D um, physiology is something I want us to kind of look at. We know that we can get vitamin D from the sun. And we know that it's kind of called the sunshine vitamin because of that. We also get it from our diet. And amazingly, there are not very many foods that have vitamin D. Can you think of any? If you watch one of my videos I did a while back, um, you know, I was kind of playing around with different grocery items. Actually, it was, it was built right around our um, shopping on a budget scenario. But anyway, um, there's a, a vegetable in the produce section that advertises it's high in vitamin D, right on the label. Should I, should I just give you the answer? Yes, of course. Vitamin D is in mushrooms. Who would have thought? But not all mushrooms, they have to be grown in a special light. So how cool is that, that this beautiful fungi uh, loaded with all kinds of um, wonderful chemicals for as, as phytoestrogens and polyphenols, but also can be uh, a great source of vitamin D. But it is considered a micronutrient. It's not very accessible, which tells me that the physiology of vitamin D is um, really something that we don't need a lot of and that is dependent on the metabolism in our body. It's not merely dependent on taking it in from an external source. So what happens with wherever we get the D, so when vitamin D is uh, activated from the sun, some, a chemical is turned on in our skin from the sun. So if you're very fair skinned, um, you have more excess to the vitamin D. If, you're, if you have a lot of melatonin, the skin is protected and also gets less vitamin D. Once that vitamin D goes into the bloodstream, it's going to go into the liver. Same thing if you eat mushrooms. And it's going to be converted by the kidney. And so when the concentration of vitamin D gets to a certain level in the kidney, if it's high or low, um, it's going to be also uh, triggered to the parathyroid, which is another endocrine. Um, oops, I got lost again. That's okay. We'll leave it out. Um, the parathyroid hormone also is going to activate the skin and turn up more responsiveness from the sun and make the liver make more. There's nothing that says, gosh, I have a craving for vitamin D. It doesn't tell us that, right? And again, it's in very micro concentrations. You'll see a very small amount of vitamin D in lots of plant-based foods as well as some animal foods. But again, it's really dependent on how it's grown. So again, most of our vitamin D is produced in our body. The kidney, the liver, the skin, the parathyroid are all organs that have a big role to play in the concentration of vitamin D. So when we study what happens to people that have low D, has anybody heard of what happens? It's very rare. In the nutrition world and, you know, in the, in the medical school arena, we open a textbook and we see people that are low in vitamin D and they have a, a term called rickets or their bones are soft and they, this is extreme. And that's really the only spot we've seen a vitamin D deficiency. So here we are, 2020, and physicians and healthcare experts are saying we all need to be supplementing vitamin D. Yet, this is a tiny little avenue of how the vitamin D gets into our body. The real smoking gun is how our organs are using the vitamin D. So we can also now, with the meta-analysis and you know, looking at research, say, for so many years we've been giving vitamin D, and gosh darn it, it hasn't been helping. Why is that? I think that's a really important smoking gun question. Why is that? And, you know, my, 
my myopic world is I only know what I can know. I'm going to study and, and understand the breadth and depth of a topic. And that tells me it's probably not worth it for me to take vitamin D supplementation. I am going to eat some mushrooms and I'm going to eat plants and animal products and I'm going to eat the best I can. I'm going to get as much sun as I can. But we also know that other than sun and somewhere in diet, it's going to depend a lot more on these organs. So now I'm going to want to make sure that my liver is functioning well and my kidney and my parathyroid. Anybody even know where your parathyroid is? It's hidden down in there, just above your, uh, your liver. But so the reality is I, I just want to get the message home that bone health and supplementation aren't necessarily going to have a good correlation. But we always go back to there's something about food sources. Now when we look at those big meta-analysis studies and we look at people groups, what people groups don't have uh, vitamin D symptoms? Well, we haven't seen rickets really anywhere, so that is important. But we don't have other uh, disease of our, of our organs in people groups that we might be able to study and understand. But now vitamin D supplementation is becoming less and less recommended because we're starting to see that the outcome is not as, as uh, robust as we were hoping. So then it always boils down to, okay, well, now what do we do? What are going to be our options when we want to maximize our health? And when we go to our little flyer here and think about bone strengthening options, if vitamin D metabolism is really a complicated story, what are our other choices? When we think of other choices, well, we know that exercise has an impact, right? So now we're talking, all right, now we're back in the playing field. Oops. So the good news is exercise pops up in more than one category, doesn't it? We can also say, oh yeah, that also matters in my cardiovascular health. So now we get to bring that one back in and if we talk about exercise, now we're saying, okay, well, I don't have to look at too many studies to know that exercise seems to have a benefit. What benefits does exercise give us? Gets your heart muscle stronger, bones stronger because we're using them. So if you use it, now the body's mechanisms start to respond in accordance. So when you put stress on your heart and you put stress on your bones, our body is so amazing that it uses the building blocks that we give it and it makes the bone stronger. So we know that exercise is a, a stimulus for change. It causes increase in bone laying down of, of new tissue. So bone new growth. And it increases muscle strength, specifically of the heart. Not to mention it burns calories. So all of these things we already know. I mean, we could go on and on and have such a long list of what exercise does for us. Now let's take it a step further and think of people groups. How many countries around the world have organized aerobics classes? Not many, right? When we think of the hundreds of countries in our world, organized exercise is not something that is commonplace. Really, it's only in the westernized culture where we have lost our ability to, to need exercise, right? And I'm only going down this path because I want us to think about what is exercise? What is the phenomenon of using our body, that stimulus? And so it doesn't have to be formal. It doesn't have to be a certain length. And this is coming from a fitness enthusiast. I've taught fitness for th over 30 years. So believe me, it's something that I hold dear to my heart. Um, but 
what I want us to think about is using our bodies in a way that helps to promote that stimulus of change, all the while not overstressing our bodies. Have you heard of um, runners that aren't healthy? What have you heard of runners that have heart disease or have, um, they're too thin or they have um, issues that we feel like, okay, this is the epitome of health and they still die of COVID. So what's happening there? So in some cases, exercise can be negative. What is too much exercise? Too much exercise is when the stimulus for change is too great and the bones aren't able to keep up. The muscles aren't able to respond in accordance with the amount of stressor that's put on it. And there's burning so many calories that now it's tipped the scales. So our body wants to find homeostasis. Homeostasis is really important because it's making sure we've got balance. So when we take a vitamin supplementation or we over-exercise, those are examples of extremes, and now our body's having a hard time finding homeostasis. So as we go on to really investigate how do we create homeostasis in, in, the, in a way that helps our organs with strong bones, helps our heart avoid cancer. And something that we're really learning about is how do we avoid these radical cells called cancer to invade our body? It's a concept that we t uh, saw a little bit in the videos. And uh, one of the physicians was describing that um, our, our body cells are just beautiful in that they find homeostasis and they react really well together. For example, the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts, those are two types of bone cells. Some break down the bone so that then the new bone can be grown. So they work in concert, break down, rebuild, ultimate strong bone. Um, l there's other cells that slough off. And so the epithelial lining in our gut, uh, old cells will slough off and new cells will come in and they just work together in a a very wholesome uh, way to get homeostasis. Mm -hmm. A cancer cell is in it only for itself. It grows fast, it hogs nutrients, and it grows uncontrollably. And by whose standards? You know, who knows why that cancer cell grows, but something in our body um, normally is going to take it over and kill it, the macrophage and the different immunoglobulin cells. For some reason, our, our immune system is not as strong as it c could be, so it isn't able to fight it off. What I want to talk about here in this little diagram is how we, c we see the big picture. Um, when we have the development of the microbiome and the development of, say, osteoporosis or out of balance, um, what, what we know to be true, and let's define the overlap. So we know that um, BMI, so the body mass index has a big role to play in whether or not our homeostasis is impacted. Of course, there'll be genetics. So some things we can't change, but something we can change, like if we have excessive use of alcohol, um, of course, physical activity has a good impact. Um, how about chronic inflammatory disease or some kind of inflammation markers? So, you know, we, we learned from the other um, videos that sometimes our mood and sometimes our level of stress can really um, cause some irritation in the bowel because there's that enteric nervous system. So we've got this important interplay of our gut biome and our psyche, how healthy and how vibrant w and how able we are to react and, and um, work in a stressful environment. So chronic inflammatory disease could certainly have an impact because of our gut biome and how well our body is able to fight off the imbalances that happen. So osteoporosis and heart disease and even cancer. Um, of course, diet. So diet, physical activity, 
these things we can change. Body mass index, we have an impact, we have a way to control that. Some things we can't change. So the interaction here is important to see where that overlap is. Now, when we start to in impact our biome, um, a negative impact would be how many antibiotics we've taken. Remember we saw that in one of the videos that early on, how often we have antibiotics seems to decrease the variety of the gut biome. And so that makes it harder for our bodies to be able to manage our external stimulus. And so having a healthy gut biome means we have a stronger immune system and we have a stronger ability to maintain our osteo um, strength, so our bone strength, as well as our cardiovascular strength. Um, I have a friend that's an RN in um, um, the ICU for babies. So she's delivering babies all, all day. And um, I asked her about the uh, number of C-sections and do, do the moms get the option to have the swab of bacteria from the birth canal given to the baby? Because I thought that was so unusual. Both of my babies were C-section and of course I never had heard of such a thing. And she said, yes, that they do offer it but that the moms have to know to ask. And I thought, how come the moms have to know this? Mm -hmm. And so now as matriarchs in our world, I want us to be able to share that as an option, that it looks like there's good evidence that a C-section baby will have less of a variety of the gut biome population if they don't get to be born via the natural birth canal. So, wow, you know, I just thought that was awesome. Um, she also mentioned that if you're not careful, C-sections can be preferred because it's easier to manage the dates, the times, the schedules, and not to mention the cost. You know, it's, it's definitely um, a, a, a bigger expense um, and somebody's getting that money. <laughs> so, you know, you want to make sure that if natural childbirth can give us some benefits, we definitely want to go that route. And oftentimes, if you have C-section the first time, the, the pregnancies following automatically get put into that category. And that was my case for sure. Um, so remember that when we look at the microbiome, what are we trying to accomplish? Of course, we want variety in that gut biome. We want numbers of the... Um, the healthy bugs. And what they're really trying to develop is those uh, essential, those short chain fatty acids. Remember that one uh, topic with the, uh, the fecal transplant and really learning about what it is that's happening in that biome. Well, it was the short chain fatty acids that seemed to be the, the tool in driving the health parameters of that gut. And so then when we think of, you know, detractors for osteoporosis and cancer and um, heart disease and really seeing what causes um, the negative impact. So if, we're, if our goal is homeostasis, what is the detractor? Well, smoking, for sure, uh, no activity, and refined sugar in the diet. So we've heard lots about refined sugar being the, the, f the frenzy, the feeding frenzy to cancer cells. Um, we know that sh refined sugar can increase the um, risk of heart disease, not only because of obesity, but also because it has so little nutrients uh, for so many calories. And so we want to, every t calorie that we eat, we want to understand, is it giving us nutrients? Mm -hmm. So when we think of refined sugar, it's not only high in calories, but it's devoid of micronutrients. And so then when we go back to that Mediterranean eating style and we think, okay, what is it about that eating style that the Americans or that the Western culture has drifted away from. Any suggestions? What, what have we done that's not part of that Mediterranean eating style? Yeah, yeah. And specifically, when we look at processed foods, it's not so much that we're not eating grains and fruits. What it really is, is how those macronutrients have been modified 
And that's the part that I think is always really important because I can't tell you how often I'll have a client that says, well, you know, we, we don't eat Christmas foods very often. You know, I don't have cherry pie around all the time. So relax, Suzanne, I don't eat it that much. But do you know how many of those once, once in a while events will happen, <laughs> right? And when I shop at HEB, I'm so aware of families' baskets. If they only knew how I was <laughs> peering in and judging them. No, I'm kidding. But it's true that when we have the f resources, we tend to shop differently than if we didn't. So again, when I look back on the big meta-analysis and the research that looks at people groups, the reason why the Western culture has more cancer and more disease than countries that, are, are clo that live closer to the earth, it's because, not because they go to an aerobics class or because they eat a lean cuisine. It's because they keep their bodies active in life and they're procuring food that is not processed. And so when we think of Mediterranean, and then this is where I want us to really be able to make notes of what are we gonna cook today? What are we gonna shop for uh, to prepare for next week? And when we think of the simplicity of healthy fats, I'm gonna use a different color here since we're on this one. Give me some examples of what you can put in your grocery cart that are healthy fats. Avocado? Yes. And what would you do with avocado? Um, Ooh, I read your mind. <laughs> put it on toast, have it in a salad. You could slice and eat it. You could make it as a dip. You could make avocado soup. You could mix it with grains. And so this is where I want us to stretch. The first thing we come to is what culture has told us. So before avocado toast got popular, we might have said, oh, well, I put it in my guacamole. And you might, all, you might not eat guacamole every day, so then it gets put to the side until you have guacamole. So what I want us to do is think about what else could we put it in? So I love it in a salad with raspberries and spinach. Um, I love it, of course, on the toast, but also just sliced and put across my eggs or um, I could fold it into my rice. Um, I had brown rice last night and I had a big handful of cilantro and a, chunks of avocado and pumpkin seeds. And yeah, that's not probably on a typical restaurant menu, but I thought it was delicious. And so thinking of unusual ways to put things together. And the reason why I could rattle off the brown rice is because I have now been freed of my fear of rice being a bad food. And rice falls, of course, into this Mediterranean pyramid. So down here, when we think of complex carbohydrates, yes, of course, there's fruits. And people will still say, gosh, if, if I have cancer in my history, is it okay to eat fruit because it has sugar in it? And so what I would say is a bowl of fruit is good. A sprinkle of fruit on your salad is better. A sprinkle of two or three different berries on a salad with two or three different herbs with a scoop of lentils on the side is great. And that's exactly what we're talking about when we say taking a food from good to great. It's good, but how do we make it great? It's the company that the food keeps. It's how it's cooked. And of course, it's the portion. I always go back to this because we can use this Mediterranean theory and we can make it into our very own best foods list. So my best foods list. It's all about f things that make me happy, that add some variety, that I pull from this big cascade of simple variety of foods that come from the earth. And of course, you don't have to be vegan. Um, protein foods are really important. Um, next week, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how protein foods um, impact our bone health and impact our heart health and create the essential building blocks for our immune system to fight off cancer. 
because I probably talked too much about plants, and so I thought I'd better make sure I'm fair <laughs> and uh, talk about protein as a nutrient. So protein, just like fats and sugars or carbs, are macronutrients. That just means those are the building blocks that our body needs in order to create homeostasis, in order to make sure our organs are working really well so that we can turn vitamin D from the inactive form that occurs in our skin to the active form that now helps keep our bones strong and helps to run our immune system and helps our uh, healthy metabolism. Because remember, we've already said, gosh, supplements don't seem to help. Why is that? That's because just taking the pill doesn't make all those other organs run optimally and really live in homeostasis. What we need to do is go back to where are we getting our proteins, fats, and carbs, those macros, so that they have as many of those micronutrients as possible. So macros are, of course, important. Micronutrients. What do I mean by that? I mean vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin K, and then all those f fun new terms that we're learning about like polyphenols and phytochemicals. We'll just group them together. Because of course we know a lot about the micronutrients of the vitamins. That's where the USDA has really talked to us about where we get our vitamins and, and then kind of develop this list and say, well, if you don't eat enough fruits and vegetables, you better take a multivitamin just in case. But they're missing this amazing and huge category we, we now are learning about, and that's the phytochemicals. And of course, all those micronutrients help our microbiome, but there's so many other ones that we just don't really know all the details. When we look back on soy, and we know that soy seems to help some, seems to perhaps not help others, why is that? Well, we're learning about that. And the reality is soy beans are just one in a many, a wide variety of complex carbohydrates that we want to be able to use. So complex carbs from fruit, from beans, what else? Beans and greens, grains. And that's why now grains are such a welcome component. Um, I just re-shared uh, the little video I did on It's All About Fish when we did the series on the video work. Um, so you can go to YouTube and still see those. I hope you will because I, I, I show you different ways to serve fish, which, of course, is a wonderful protein that's part of the Mediterranean eating style. And with that fish, what do we combine with it? We can combine beans, we brown rice, we could do um, shredded cabbage, we could do um, salsa, we could do avocado, we can do corn tortillas. All of those now give us a great way to have good company of those carbohydrates, uh, show you different ways to cook that fish so that your portion control is well balanced with all the other um, veggies as part of that meal. And so healthy fats, complex carbs that come in a wide variety. Um, when we think of the items that are up here a little bit higher, wh what do you think is in, in that section? Yep. There he is with that saturated fat. Saturated fat specifically from red meats and also sugars. Now don't, don't think for a minute that that French family that I lived with for so long in, um, when I was right out of high school, they, didn't, they had sweets. But in the scheme of things, it was such a small amount. And now do a window into what our families might have had for Christmas dinner. We probably had four or five desserts. What else? Kind of describe your, your, or maybe not. Maybe your family just said, you know, we're not going to have any of these. We just want to have these. Anything? Some favorite salads. I know um, my family used to do a, a green salad. I don't even know. I think it's called Green Goddess. Um, and, of course, two different pies. And um, my mom was an amazing 
baker she could make the most wonderful uh, pie crusts and so now in my adult life i love to that science of making a great pie crust but i really don't like to have too much pie so we had one pie um, we had six people and we all had a little piece of it and it worked out just fine but i know in some pictures i've seen in facebook the dessert play, um, table was huge uh, and not to mention the candy canes and um, you know when my boys were little we always had a heated discussion on what went in their stocking because I wanted to do one thing and my husband wanted to do uh, candies go to Costco and get a whole bunch of candies and put in there <laughs> and I didn't like that idea but that's tradition right and so our culture has steeped our thinking in what it means to have a special abundant holiday and in our world a special and abundant might mean a whole lot of this in the Mediterranean um, family they're there but there's a lot of other things too Another thing that the Mediterranean um, people use a lot more than perhaps we do is cheese. So that kind of falls in here. Of course, the nuts are one that I really love, and that's in that same kind of ballpark, kind of in the middle. Again, below the all-important olive oil. So whether we have the culture that pushes sugars or whether we have the culture that pushes a wide variety of foods is I think where we have our most opportunity. And going from good to great means that we can choose what kind of poultry, what kind of fish. We can also look at um, in maybe instead of always doing chicken, experiment with another kind of poultry. So there's turkey. Um, yes, I love those. And then learning how to cook them so that now we can add in more and more of our vegetable plants and uh, herbs. So 30 a day is still an accomplishable goal. So if we put uh, a day in the life of this, knowing that we want to think of bone strength and cardiovascular health and warding off cancer and warding off the symptoms that we feel when our hormone systems shift, what would that day look like? And so that's what I really want us to end with is a day in the life of 30 a day and proving our bone strength by not necessarily looking for vitamin D, but also we want to look at micronutrients, and we want to look at balance. Balance of exercise, balance of healthy foods, because ultimately we don't have all the answers, and we know that if our liver is functioning well, and our pancreas, and our skin, all of those components help us get the ideal metabolism to make that vitamin D active. And then of course for cardiovascular health, we want to make sure that we have balance, so plenty of exercise, but not so much that that becomes the all important check off that now we have the risk of over exercising. Um, we also want the healthy fats, fiber and variety. So just as a wrap up for kind of where our focus is, the other part is with those symptoms that are really noticeable when we age and our uh, hormone levels are challenging us. We know that we have a little bit harder time with sleep. We have a little bit of harder time with um, ideal body weight or maintaining your ideal body weight. Of course, temperature fluctuations, we'll call them hot flashes. I guess guys don't really have that one, lucky you. But those symptoms are all going to be really played on with that homeostasis. And so as we create our day, I want us to be thinking about how can we create our, our ideal day for our gut biome, as well as our ideal body weight and getting those nutrients in. So what should we have for breakfast? Did anybody try the multigrain cereal that I challenged you with a while back? Uh, the Central Market uh, Great Grains. Um, it's just a, it's a little bag. Um, well, there's two. The little bag of Great Grains, I did. Uh, I did a bulgur cereal. 
There's also Bob's Red Mill does a multi-grain cereal. So just trying to get more grains. Oatmeal is fantastic. So if that's your go-to, take that one from good to great and add in your chia, hemp hearts, your flax, maybe some organic dried cherries. Uh, instead of a sweetener, maybe a sprinkle of maybe some fresh berries. So that would be a great grain to go with. Bulgur is just a new one. And I was thinking of you guys, so I made it, and I loved it. Um, I used um, fresh ground star anise and uh, allspice and cloves and fresh raspberries, and it was so good. So that was my breakfast. So, yes, raspberries, mighty seeds. Okay, and then for beverage... You could do tea or coffee. And then for afternoon snack, I'm sorry, for mid-morning snack, let's do, what, what should we put in our mid-morning snack? Fruit. Yeah, give me an example. What kind of fruit? Okay, so let's do an apple and let's add something to it. There we go. And just for fun, let's try cashew butter. Just because it's different. We're expanding our variety if we can get 30 a day. And then maybe for lunch, what should we do for lunch? H how about um, spring mix? So our spring mix has to have at least five different lettuces. You know where I'm going with this. I'm gonna get to my 30. Okay, and then uh, we're gonna have avocado and we're gonna have sunflower seeds. And let's do a walnut oil. Ooh, I'm getting up there. Walnut oil, and let's do, um, have you ever tried some of the sprouts? Some of the little micro sprouts? There's some really good ones now. Um, broccoli sprouts, I just tried those. They, they last really well in your fridge too, as long as they don't get wet. And then should we put a little slice of um, tuna or maybe some salmon on the salad? Or do you think it's good the way it is? Either or, okay, let's go ahead and put a uh, slice of tuna on our salad. Afternoon snack, what should we put in here? You wanna do, um, we didn't really put dairy in here and I know dairy is not a big part of the Mediterranean, so it's, it's up there fairly high. And of course their favorite use of dairy is cheese and then yogurt. Um, cheese is down a little farther in the pyramid because cheese is part of a really regular um, segment of the meal. But yogurt is a very common snack. So we'll put that in there. Yeah. True. That's such a good point. Not the yellow. Mm -mm, but they do use... Um, heavily aged and fermented and of course the feta is a little more in the greek regions rather than the northern parts but yeah i mean feta is a great one in fact you know i don't want you to be too afraid of putting different kinds of fats on your salad um because of course you're going to put at least four or five handfuls of, of greens in there right <laughs> of course we are <laughs> and then for your afternoon snack uh, yogurt and maybe some almonds and again i want you to get hungry so I don't want you to look at the label and go, how much is a portion? Oh, it's six ounces and a quarter cup. Okay, that's what I should have. No, 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 no. Start with what you might feed your five-year-old. And I'm serious. Start small. And then if you want a little more, you can always have it. Lastly, for dinner, let's do our um, quinoa. So another grain. And we're going to dress that with maybe some herbs like arugula. And maybe we'll put in some garbanzo beans for our protein. And maybe some edamame. And I'm sorry? And more avocado. Yes, because we don't want the avocado to go bad. Surely we didn't eat the whole thing up here. So now we've got to put it down here too. Good thinking. So there you have it. I mean, easily could get into that high numbers. Um, of course, we didn't talk about how we seasoned our walnut oil, how we seasoned our avocado. We could put herbs on it is where I'm going with that. Um, 
And when you shop for these, just know that the way you preserve them in, in your refrigerator will easily allow them to last a week. And so now you don't have to go shopping more than once a week in order to eat with a wide variety of uh, foods from the earth. So I hope this has helped you, and I'm so excited to, to see you again soon and uh, hear some of the ways you have added different nutrients to help build your bone strength, maintain your cardiovascular health, and fight off the, the changes of hormones that all of us uh, deal with as we progress through the ages. So thank you so much. Thank you.